-hmm. Okay, well, welcome everyone. I hope everyone is 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 hearing me. Um, my name is Karin Bailey from University of West Indies. I'll be your um, your host, your um, moderator for today's um, session. Welcoming you to the My Food Network um, webinar webinar series number fifteen. Um, we'll be hearing from um, Natalie Dietrich Jones and um, Shiva Mahan today, um, navigating data. Um, silences, um, researching migration in the Caribbean. So um, let me start just by saying a little bit about the uh, My Food Network. The Migration and Food Security uh, Project it aims to design and implement new and innovative global research and knowledge mobilization agenda um, focused on the interactions between migration and food society within the global South. The project is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and it's been imp implemented um, by the, the Hungry Cities Partnership, um, or HCP, which, which is a research collaboration between over 90 researchers and, and partner organizations in 13 countries. Um, feel free to check out the uh, MyFood um, website, myfood.org, to if you want to learn more about the um, project and um, other projects that um, it, it is involved in. Um, I'm going to introduce the um, two speakers uh, in a moment. I just wanted to um, say a bit about the uh, origin of the uh, the work that that they did. Obviously, this session is about um, their work and not the um, book that it emerged from. But I just think it's it's useful to give a little bit of a, uh, a background on it. Um, that that book uh, uh, emerged out of. Uh, um, qualitative research group that we have at the um, University of Western is specifically the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of, of Social and Economic Studies, of which um, Dr. Dietrich Jones uh, is a part. Um, we really just wanted to uh, uh, add our voice, or I should say, add the voices of uh, qualitative researchers um, in the region to um, Caribbean academic um, literature. Uh, we, we thought that there was a gap in um, showcasing the research that is done by way of qualitative research um, within within the region. It's uh, uh, We still feel that it is a, 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 a space that is dominated by um, pos the positivist um, um, tradition. So we we had wanted to uh, make, make a contribution that was was counter to that. And I think what we're uh, putting, so we are particularly proud of the fact that we were able to showcase the uh, interdisciplinary nature of um, qualitative research that uh, um, takes place within the region and about the region um, against the background of more um, interpretivist um, thinking. And um, the, the chapter that uh, Dr. Jesus Jones and Dr. Mohan are going to um, speak to uh, went a long way um, to doing that as well. Natalie Dietrich Jones is a research fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies at the University of West Indies Mona campus. Her interests include geographies of the border, governance of migration, and intra-regional migration in the Caribbean. She's the chair of the Migration and Development Cluster, which is an interdisciplinary group of researchers that explore contemporary issues concerning migration in the Caribbean and its diaspora. She holds an MPhil in, in Development Studies from the University of Cambridge and a PhD in Development Policy and, and, and Management from the University of Manchester. She's currently undertaking a multi-sided project on the response to Venezuelan migration in small island developing states in the Southern Caribbean. And she's also principal investigator for the Jamaica um, Kingston component of, of South-South migration and, and migrant food insecurity, interactions, impacts, and, and remedies um, um, project. It's, it's part of the, the My Food project, um, um, a multi city research initiative which is led by the um, Wilfred Laurier Uni Laurier um, University. Shiva Mohan is a human geographer with research interests situated at the um, interface of migration and mobility studies, island studies, and, and political geography. His work seeks to underscore the ambivalences, contradictions, and, and precarities within migrants' lived experiences, in addition to those faced by territories vis-a-vis -vis, um, transnational migration. Um, Shiva is currently a research fellow at the, the Canada Excellence Research Chair um, in Migration and um, Integration Program at Toronto Metropolitan University, where he leads two research projects, 
as part of a Horizon Europe consortium, the measuring irregular migration and related policies in the, in the Canadian context project, and the um, Solid City project investigating intergovernmentalism and firewalls. Shiva is a member of the Migration and Development Research Cluster at the Sir Arthur Institute, Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. Uh, um, he is also an associate researcher and trustee with Swiss-based Swiss um, research NGO, Environmental Mobility Research Unit. Um, welcome again. Um, the, the, the two speakers will take over. I think they're each going to speak for um, 20 to 25 minutes. Please be reminded to um, post your questions in the in the Q and A section so we can um, speak. The, the speakers can speak to them afterwards. Natalie and Shiva. Okay, thank you, Professor Bailey. I am going to open my screen if I can. Okay. All right, just to say, I'm really happy to see everyone online. I, I think there are a few colleagues from studies and, and maybe one member from the Migration and Development Cluster at Sabesis, as well as a few students. So thank you everyone for joining. And as Professor Bailey indicated, we'll be sharing our reflections on our experiences doing fieldwork on the Venezuelan migration crisis in the Southern Caribbean. I'm just gonna put up a map for those who may not be very familiar with the region uh, to locate ourselves, um, I would say geo geographically, but also geopolitically. We are doing research on sites that are, are no located north of Venezuela. So you should see Trinidad and Tobago to the right of the map, just above Venezuela there. And then to the left, the ABC islands of Aruba, Curacao, and Bonaire. So our research um, reflections focus on just two of those spaces, which um, have been experiencing increased arrivals of Venezuelans since 2014. If you're not familiar with the subject matter, just to say that since that um, significant date, it's actually been 10 years since the crisis has started, as many as 7.7 .7 million people have left Venezuela, most to South America, and then um, also to the Southern Caribbean. However, that region is not as well scoped or researched as the other destinations, and Shiva and I, we're doing research at different temporal moments um, and in two, two different geographies. Um, but we, we, all, we realized that we had similar experiences while undertaking our field work. We have sought to reflexively think through what those parallels in our experiences were. And we came up with this concept of silences in order to explain the structural barriers that prevented our access to the voices, discourses, and data that were essential to our research. And if you do get the opportunity to read the full chapter, um, we actually were afraid our research was going to be derailed because of these structural factors. Um, and essentially what the chapter presents, and Shiva will focus on that bit, is recommendations to scholars who may encounter sim similar structural barriers when they're undertaking their research. We have sought to make a contribution to the literature by um, proposing this concept of, of um, silences. I'm sorry, I'm on campus. I hope you're not hearing the noise in the background but um right so we came up with these um three areas of contribution to the scholarship on um engaging in qualitative research particularly doing interviews um so we broadened the, the 
the concept of silence beyond the interview setting to look at the, the broader fieldwork landscape. And, and what we seek to offer is an expanded view of silences and also link discourses on access and silence um, in two ways. Um, by looking at the data, the structural data constraints, which we could call silences, and then the silencers who are the different um, individuals who can, um, well, positively or negatively, but we focus on the negative side um, of the prevention of access to critical migration data. Okay, so we, we, we encountered different types of silences in the field. And so these occur at different scales in terms of, if we're thinking in, in terms of geography, at different scales, starting from the, the macro going down to, to the micro. Um, what we encountered was essentially a space or spaces which were um, spaces which were lacking um, consolidated um, but also disaggregated data on migration, Venezuelan migration flows to the respective destinations that we were studying. And uh, we sought to approach the um, trying to to categorize what areas those silences fell into. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But essentially, we, we, we try to explain what might be the reason behind this um, significant data gap. Now, just to say that data is a very hard thing to come by in the Caribbean generally. And so this is not an issue that's necessarily specific to migration studies, but it was um, meaningful to us because it operated um, or we were operating in a space that was essentially um, what we call very noisy. So there is a lot of xenophobic and anti-immigrant rhetoric in these spaces, a lot of conversation around migration and how states were incapable of responding to the crisis. But as researchers, we couldn't find data. We couldn't identify the numbers of persons who are arriving, the frequency of their arrivals, um, the length of their stay, for example. And uh, the factors that explain this are institutional. Um, there are a limited number of migration experts working in the in the region, um, in 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 what is essentially a very securitized field because immigration falls on the the usually in this region national security ministry. The limited number of experts who possess migration data and knowledge and who are in fact willing to share that information. There is weak migration data collection and reporting, and this has been chronicled in different ways by institutional stakeholders like the International Organization for Migration. Um, so that's maybe changing a bit because there has been an effort to, to try to, to beef up capacity and encourage data collection, but by and large, very limited availability of data, especially in relation to on, on um, I would say undocumented, but um, also refugee and asylum seekers. So what we encountered was a space that had a what we call a preponderance of reluctant respondents. This is, reluctant respondents is not our term. It's comes from Adlan Adlo, um, long-time persons working in qualitative research, who speak to the challenges conducting research in sensitive data areas. Um, and it's also not specific, this reality that is to um, Caribbean migration research. So when you're doing research on clandestine migration, this is actually one of the things that is often referenced. Um, 
but for us as emerging researchers um, working at different points in our careers, trying to collect data, this was a significant issue because we didn't have um, as well established connections or networks with people in these geographical spaces that we were trying to, to navigate. So the two spaces, um, two island geographies struggling with um, crisis, and we can debate whether in the absence of data, you can concretely say it is a crisis um, because how, how can you quantify or justify that claim? But there are reportedly high levels of clandestine mi migration. You will see a lot of media reports about uh, missing migrants and also the perilous journeys that migrants, uh, migrants undertake by sea to arrive to these destinations. Um, these numbers within the context of the Southern Caribbean are high relative to population size. So even though the numbers are quite minuscule relative to the arrivals in the larger countries like Colombia, Brazil, um, and so on, um, relative to the populations, I think Aruba at one point had received the highest number of Venezuelans in 2018 or 2019. So a crisis is, is emerging and the political elite are debating this issue in the public domain, but refusing to engage with scholars on um, academics who want to undertake research in this area. And this is also operating within a context of a restrictive, a restrictive approach to migration management, um, which is classified by a detention and deportation approach, which is heavily criticized by the international community organizations such as Amnesty International and, and Human Rights Watch. So we read these silences in different ways. Um, we, we, the approach that we took was to think of silence um, as a way to preserve the status quo. So political elites were reluctant to share information because speaking about their response to the crisis would challenge the um, de facto approach of restrictive, a restrictive migration regime. Uh, there was also a, apparently a distrust distrust of academicians. I've encountered this in, in other research across the region. And so in, in a space where there is an optic that is about um, preserving national identity, keeping scarce resources for the national population, um, sharing any information within an interview context is going to disrupt that um, political storyline. And then there is also lack of transparency with regard to management of the crisis um, and just generally migration management. So um, without the efforts of organizations like Amnesty International who might report how many people are deported annually or how many people are detained, it's very difficult to know um, that data um, off, offhand. So that's the space that we're navigating in. I also have a question mark there about research fatigue because a lot of teams were going in and trying to investigate this issue. And so was it, uh, um, was it the case that these politicians were just tired of speaking with people about this issue? Um, so I'm gonna hand over to, to Shiva. He's gonna talk through theoretically um, the transition in, in understandings of silence and then address methodologically how we, said, how we recommend scholars deal with these constraints of silence. Thanks so much, Natalie, and thanks <clears throat> to the organizers of uh, this series. It's, uh, it's nice to be here and see some familiar names uh, from Laurie and other places. So this chapter was um, particularly uh, poignant for Natalie and I because it was a sort of self-reflective exercise. Um, uh, just sitting, having a conversation, talking through the obstacles that we um, 
attempted to surmount and the ways that we surmounted them in the field. Um, <clears throat> but writing this chapter also had us think about what was there existing uh, theoretically? How could we conceptually ground this idea of silences and, and make our own arguments for uh, the, the Caribbean region specifically? And so we found that there, there has been a sort of um, conceptual, uh, conceptual onto epistemological evolution of what sil silence is meant in, in the literature and, and in practical terms for qualitative researchers, moving from um, totally ignoring what sciences are because qualitative researchers would engage directly in analyzing language and voice, right? Asking questions about what was said and obviously how, how it was said. But then <clears throat> with uh, a turn in the appreciation of how uh, sciences were uh, imbued with power, agency and expression. So just as equally important or perhaps even more important of what was said is what was not said. And so taking on this new appreciation, especially um, from feminist and uh, decolonial scholars, um, <clears throat> They, they they started to uh, really think through the idea, the utility and the application of silences um, in qualitative uh, research and analysis, and started using these as points of analysis. Uh, as points of analysis, so we take our, our kind of conceptual point of departure from people who ask questions around silences: how were they said? What was not said? Um, how they how they manifested itself, sorry, what was not said, in which context it, it was said um, from people like Bhattacharya and other other scholars. Um, so when we 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 thought through how this this evolution sort of manifested, we we took on uh, we took on entry points from feminist uh, uh, and and deconstructivist through that that feminist deconstructivist lens. Um, and to advance the argument that silence is perhaps one of the new languages in, in qualitative research uh, for us to, to, to ground our observations. Uh, Natalie, if you could just switch. So in, in, in a section of the paper, Natalie has already given a brilliant uh, sort of overview and con con contextual framing of, of the kinds of research we were doing and the data landscape, what exists and what does not exist in the Caribbean region. Um, we decided to propose through our, our observations, some considerations for researchers who are in fact engaging in migration, migration research specifically in the Caribbean region. And we wa I want to preface this by saying that this is not prescriptive, it's not uh, formulaic, but it, it is something to consider when going into the field and um, interacting with, with uh, some of the situations that you would you might find yourself. And in the first instance, we talk about understanding uh, the Caribbean as an intimate geography. And yes, we don't necessarily mean a small geography, but what we're talking about is a kind of intimacy of knowledge. Um, so privileging the, the sort of his, historical geographical connections that Caribbean people are, you know, so closely connected uh, with their land and with community and privileging as well the well-networked local and community views. Uh, so, for example, um, people in Caribbean communities are quite aware uh, in, in a lot of instances of what is happening on the ground. So, of course, we're talking in the context of migration here. And in uh, in our findings and in our engagement in the field, the local the local people knew where uh, Venezuelan migrants were entering the country, but also what were the kinds of opportunities that exist and were exploited by migrants to enter into the the um, the, the the labor market, for for example. And so it is important that our researchers engage with the gatekeepers. Um, <clears throat> in the community, um, so because they are the ones who will allow um, access uh, to the community and the study. But we also want to um, mention this caveat of the perceptions of people in the local community. For example, in the context that we we had we we've studied, there was there was a high degree of xenophobia, and so this can 
obviously impact the kinds of perspective perspectives that researchers uh, engage in the field. So people should be researchers should be mindful because this uh, the local sort of xenophobic anti-immigrant perspectives can filter into the analysis um, into the narratives and the analysis that the researcher uh, ultimately uh, engages in. The second point we want to mention is around migrant precarity. Um, and while this is not 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 exactly, you know, uh, a Caribbean centric sort of um, uh, unique uh, observation, what we a lot of the Venezuelans, uh, Venezuelans that are coming into these various contexts are, move, are doing so clandestinely or irregularly. So outside of the law and outside of uh, our visibility. And so um, their situations are quite precarious in the eyes of the law. And as researchers, we have a sort of ethical responsibility to the population under study and ourselves as well to uh, maintain the confidentiality and the privacy of migrants. And in Caribbean territories like we were engaged in, this is, is quite the, 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 the degree of caution uh, that one must take is, is, is quite amplified in these in these contexts. Uh, so the the um, the the kinds of access that one gains uh, from from precarious uh, immigrant communities is sort of mediated by their levels of com comfortability. So, for example, in my instance, uh, I partnered with an NGO in Trinidad to gain access to the migrant the Venezuelan migrant community, and I had to sign a legal document, a uh, confidentiality agreement. And so when the potential respondents were um, were approached and, and knew that I had this uh, this confidentiality agreement, of course, there would be legal, legal repercussions if I contravened uh, this uh, arrangement. They, in fact, felt uh, a little bit more comfortable to open up and to, to, to tell their stories. Um, the the third point I want to talk about is the fluidity of interviews and interviewing, of course, um, in in different circumstances, and especially in the in 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 particular the Venezuelan uh, crisis, it's a traumatic experience for uh, for the migrants who have been forcibly or uh, uh, displaced or have taken the the um, taken the. The, who have made the decision to, to leave Venezuela uh, seeking a better life. And so when, as a researcher, you are uh, engaging with uh, this community of people, again, the, 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 uh, the, their comfortability is what matters. So, for example, triggering questions may elicit a very emotional response or an absolute non-response from uh, the respondents. And so... Uh, the idea that we put here, uh, put forward here, is to perhaps rephrase or refrain from asking certain questions, but also letting the conversation um, pragmatically and and organically unfold. So, or as as we quote in the in the chapter, let the narrative breathe. Um, in in instances where you know situations can trigger trigger persons, and also. The kinds of silences, uh, in addition to uh, so at uh, this point analyzing silences in context, the kinds of silences we go back to the kind of um, the the questions that uh, Bhattacharya and others ask about the context in which you know the question was posed, the the kinds of response, but also leaning on what is existing, um, what 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 kind of knowledge is is already existing in the context to gauge um, a response. And the fourth point I have on the screen is weaving the state's narrative in the face of silences. And this really is one of the major points that prompted Natalie and I to engage in this research because it seemed as if it was one of the most prominent structural obstacles that we faced. And of course, the state's narrative as being one of the major stakeholders in any sort of migration phenomenon dynamic is important to include in any kind of analysis. And so when the state does not want to speak with you directly, uh, in my case and in Natalie's case, there was a lot of prevarication by the state. Although Natalie was lucky serendipitously to uh, meet with uh, someone uh, in in government, uh, we have to find ways to sort of um, navigate uh, this 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 big silence, this big uh, this structural obstacle. And so, what we suggest um, 
in sort of weaving the state's weaving and stitching the state's nar narrative is to look at peripheral or sort of non-conventional uh, resources. I won't say non-conventional, maybe peripheral. Um, so uh, you have sources such as um, parliamentary hansards or government reports or gray literature, or even policy actions that you see unfold um, in the context, media coverage, for example. Um, to sort of weave and stitch what the state narrative looked like. And obviously, at this point, you need to figure out uh, the veracity, the truthfulness of, of what this, the, the state is, is doing. And so by sort of weaving this narrative through this these peripheral sources, you can um, assess that or analyze that against what is actually unfolding on the ground. Um, in this instance as well, we've also seen uh, more researchers engage in freedom of information requests uh, by uh, to, to certain governments to release certain information and data. Um, but there are, there, are, there are also obstacles, structural obstacles here, because while there is a prescription, a prescriptive time for governments to respond to these FOIs, um, they are always asking for delays. So it's always a delayed exercise. Um, and in addition to that, when uh, documents are produced, they are also um, redacted. But we, just like I, I had a little caveat or a little point to be mindful about earlier in one of our, in my earlier points, we must also be cognizant and mindful about our own biases. And if by us weaving and stitching this narrative based on um, peripheral information, if our own uh, biases are sort of imprinted on the analysis that we engage in. And I, this is a this is a, a pervasive struggle struggle not only at, at at weaving the state's narrative but also other analytical exercises. And the fifth point speaks to um, what Natalie mentioned earlier about the data landscape in um, in the Caribbean region or the lack of uh, data that we we have the uh, kind of the uh, deficiency um, in comprehensive and systematic data collection. A lot of the data or country specific data are produced and released by uh, countries, uh, territory, by the governments of these uh, these territories. And so we advise the researcher to consider the timing of this release. Is it in response to a certain eventuality that happened? Uh, what sort of narrative is the government trying to, or the state trying to, um, to, to put out? Um, uh, and also, you know, to, to what end? To what end what, what, what were the data released? So I think um, the timing and the integ integrity of the, the data that is released is, is an, important, um, an important element to also consider when researching uh, migration in the Caribbean, Natalie. You muted Natalie, sorry. Thank you. All right. So we'll just wrap up quickly with some questions to kind of invite conversation. Um, Cochrane suggests that without access, there can be no research. And so in a way, we've sought to challenge that perspective by proposing these alternate points um, of data in order to respond to important questions in the domain of um, research into undocumented migration. So um, maybe just to say that sometimes it might be dangerous to confront silences, um, especially when you're engaging with persons who are more powerful than you. So there is an imbalance. Um, so to what degree do you press to break the silence? Um, and so when the state purposely sets barriers to access, what is the most effective response? Um, so thank you for listening. We're gonna hand over to Professor Bailey to moderate the Q&A and we look forward to the questions. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. I, I, I enjoyed that. Um, obviously I'm, I'm familiar with having which was um, a part of the um, publication. Um, so while, those in the audience are thinking about the questions. Um, th there's one I wanted to ask because it, it's something that I'm constantly confronting in my my own work as well. You spoke about um, the the need and the 
um, the fact that you have to confront confront and embrace your uh, own biases as it relates to the um, the research that that you're doing. Can you say a bit about what those um, biases were for this specific to this research? Um, Shiva, you can go ahead and then I'll follow. <laughs> it triggered me. <laughs> um, I think you know, as migration uh, researchers, we 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 tend to to skew our perspective towards the preservation of the integrity and the dignity of the migrant community, and not necessarily um, take on board if the action of the state is in fact augering in a good way for that community. So I, I feel like in in my work, although the Trinidad, Trinidad government's response is very slow, I am still critical of the action, but it was a bias uh, that I had to, to sort of surmount. Um, even uh, right now, the only sort of policy action that Trinidad has engaged with, with uh, towards the Venezuelans is the, migra the migrant registration framework, which is essentially a, a labor exemption um, permit. Um, and I still think that it is a politically expedient move. It is a is an ad hoc sort of wait and see move. But um, on the ground, it does give the migrant community a degree of protection, not, not in the kind of way that I want to see. Um, you know, from a biased perspective of regularizing and properly integrating Venezuelans into Trinidad society. Natalie? Right. So I agree whole, wholeheartedly about um, the way that we think about the state's approach and um, classifying it primarily as negative rather than thinking through um, how that approach might um, complement or support the the national the general national feeling and um, agenda of the the broader community um, what I will also say is that um, there is a danger because the international community is highly critical because it has a rights-based approach to migration and and so you find yourself, um, well, I'm a um, pro-migration person, open migration, so trending more towards that. And so kind of by default, highly skeptical of any moves that the government makes in, rela in relation to the management of migration. Um, so it's kind of, you want to see better, but the, the steps that are taken usually affirm the perspective that you have. Um, and then also, um, and then also the, sorry, I had, a, I had another point, it will come back, but just to say that it is very difficult in a small island context to try to manage a crisis effectively. And uh, you hope that the government will be open. So this is the second point that I was trying to make. The government will be open to sharing um, the challenges that they face because it feeds into the future in terms of if there is another crisis, this is the lesson that we learned. This is not the approach to take or this is the approach to take. But if they're not sharing at all how they've arrived at the decisions that they need, then it's going to be very difficult to craft a response to a future crisis. Um, so that's what I would say in response to, to that question about, about bias. Right. Um, thank you for that. Particularly important for um, you know um, countries and regions that are constantly in crisis. <laughs> that's, that's, yes. That's OK. <laughs> We have um, one question here, um, complementing your presentation, um, but um, asking what some of the themes are that immigrant participants um, were reluctant to speak about. Um, so I didn't meet with migrants directly, excepting through the representative of one of the migrant organizations, actually one of the few 
migrant organizations in the region. Um, I can speak to previous experience um, doing research on undocumented migration and then um, I'll hand over to Shiva. Um, so typically in research on undocumented migration, persons are afraid to meet. They don't want their status to become public knowledge, public in terms of the community, but also public to the government. And so it's usually difficult to, to to make arrangements to meet with people and you have to go through gatekeepers and that can take a while. And so this is one of the issues we actually don't really confront directly in the text is um, if you have a time constraint, you're doing PhD research or you have a project that you need to finish, um, reaching out to these communities um, and through the gatekeepers is actually really important because it helps you do that in a quick, quick, quicker manner than if you didn't have that network connection. Um, so in, in other research that I've done, this is for my PhD research doing um, undocumented CARICOM migration in mm -hmm. Barbados. The migrants were afraid to talk about, um, so they, they would say how they got to the, to the country. They would maybe talk about the family that they left behind, the way that they support that family, but they didn't necessarily want to, to say um, how they arrived, like the timing of that arrival, and then also some of the things that they had to do to survive, because it also meant overlap with other types of illegal or criminal activities. So some women, for example, might be engaged in commercial sex and they may not want to talk about that. Um, and then also um, they, they may talk about the exploitation, the experience at work um, with a view to saying that like um, it's employers exploit them because they benefit from the labor, but then they don't want to pay, but then not necessarily confront their own um, decision to migrate in that fashion. Because sometimes it is a, a choice to move in that way. It's not always a choice. So the, the, the types of survival strategies that they use, if they overlap with criminal activity, they may not want to divulge that. And then they may vote or confront their decisions to, to travel in an undocumented country. Yeah, I would um I would agree. I see some threads in uh, Natalie's previous research. And I did in fact engage with Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad. And I the way I approached the lines of question was almost mapping their journey from Venezuela, starting with their decision making. Uh, to if that shifted while they were in Trinidad and kinds of activities in terms of survival uh, that they were doing in Trinidad. And I found it quite peculiar um, when people, they would broadly say, you know, we were persecuted back home, but especially if they hint that it was a sort of political persecution that they were experiencing, they chose not to uh, divulge the specifics of what was going on um because at that time and i still i think i still think this is the case that the venezuela government and trinidad were uh, sort of collaboratively um <clears throat> working for for repatriation exercises etc um in addition to i'm just echoing what natalie had said uh people are not very forthcoming about their personal circumstance and the way that they were able to um, survive, for example, the kinds of work that work that they engage in. So they would perhaps make a general statement, the boss is not doing this, we're being underpaid, that sort of thing. Um, but not not really divulge what's happening with them personally. And again, I can only speculate it's because of fear of uh getting that information getting out and you know some sort of reprisal or something like that. Um interestingly as well, uh, my 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 sample my my um research sample was skewed towards women and i found that um women tended to be a little bit a little bit more vocal than the way um as compared to uh male respondents in in the way 
and the sort of descriptive way that uh, that um, that they would respond to to certain prompts and questions. So I think um, it I, I did not find too much resistance in terms of uh, the way people actually moved from Venezuela to the island. Uh, you know, they said they came by the boat or they came by a plane and they were here for a while, that sort of thing. Um, and also some were hesitant to divulge uh, what their status was uh, at that point in time. Uh, so I think the, I think what also um, sort of gauges or mediates the, the silence is also the context of what was happening in the in the island at that point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, another question coming in. Um, can you please elaborate on how your interview data is, is disruptive of political storylines and how the state's narrative can be a silencer in migration research? Okay, um, thanks, Jen John. Um, so the political elites tend to frame migration as a negative phenomenon, as something that is a drain on national resources, that migrants are basically exploiting um, public welfare systems. So too many are coming to the hospital, too many are in our schools. Um, what That's the storyline. But the flip side to that, which is not often documented, and um, Mercedes had posed a question of also about the way that um, who, who is presenting the narrative and what that means. So international organizations have been challenging that by trying to highlight the fact that migrants are in fact contributing to these societies. So they are doing um, essential work, although they're in, involved in the informal economy. So they're carrying out essential work, contributing to taxes through VAT, for example, um, in enhancing cultural diversity, um, which is something that historically is not unfamiliar um, because Venezuelan migration to these regions has been going on for, for centuries. So enriched, cul enriched cultural diversity, contribution to the um, informal and formal labor market for the ones who can work formally, that is often not highlighted. So when the political elites don't want to engage in interviews to basically um, dissect all the components of uh, migrants' contribution to society, that's what we mean. That's one example anyway, of how an interview could potentially disrupt the political narrative. Yeah, and I just want to, to, to latch on to what Natalie was saying about um, data, and I think this speaks more to Mercedes question. Um, in Trinidad, and I think th this is the case, Natalie, in, in Curacao, correct me if I'm wrong, that the publishing of government with data was in response to what agencies like the IOM and UNHCR had put out there. And that, that in itself, you know, the government was saying, look, the number you have estimated could not be near uh, what was actually going on on the ground. And so I can speak for Trinidad that um, it was at that point that the registration framework was um, was launched. And so while the UNHCR at one point had projected something like 40,000 or 50,000 Venezuelans in Trinidad, the Trinidad government came and said, no, look, we have this registration exercise and we've We've done like six. We've we've gotten like sixteen thousand people, or or something that was um, menial. So, I think um, I think that the government is also it's a two sided kind of uh, issue. Uh, the international agencies, like you pointed out, in South America are disrupting the the state storyline, but the government is also trying to project and um, to counter what the the extent external agencies are saying. Okay, thanks for that, Shiva. Um, an another question here from Godfrey. Um, beyond the data silences that you've alluded to, and he's he's interested in knowing whether or not you uh in your work you've come across data silences arising out of the 
self-censorship of the migrant communities, wherein migrant organizations and individual migrants are reluctant to share information and or experiences that they may consider would endanger or worsen their already um, precarious conditions. Yeah, so thanks for that question, Godfrey. And it's actually a really interesting question because we're we're negotiating small spaces where, as Shiva said, the community knows where these people are, right? They know where they are, they know where they live. In Aruba and Curacao, there are actually um, particular communities that are identified as um, um, Hispanic communities and some as either like Dominican Republic or Venezuelan specifically. So they're hidden, but they're not really hidden. Um, but in, because there is so much fear around being discovered by poli um, um, agencies of the state, this, this is like the police and soldiers who do routinely go around communities and try to um, detain migrants with a view to deporting them, persons wish to remain hidden um, from that um, perspective. So they may not be forthcoming, as I said earlier, to divulge that their status. Um, and part of their negotiating with us in terms of the power dynamic is refusing to speak. Um, so it is an, an interesting question because they are hidden. Um, and they try to maintain that um, lack of visibility through silence, but really, are they, are they really in such small spaces? Um, in such small spaces, are they really um, out of the purview of the state? So um, Shiva, I think you have a similar experience. Yeah, I, um, so I, and I know people in the chat would be familiar with the Living Water community in Trinidad, the uh, Catholic NGO. <clears throat> um, this is the agency, the, the NGO that I partnered with to gain access. And so I think what I would say, what I would, would say from my experience is that um, the, the migrant community who I engaged with, um, they sort of le le um, leaned on Living Waters community to kind of establish parameters as to what could be divulged as, as well like that. I feel like that was also an, uh, an um, impacting or influencing factor. Uh, so for example, uh, sometimes I had to be very flexible and reflexive in, in the way that I would engage with people in the field. Uh, at, that, at that time, this was before the migrant registration framework exercise, et cetera. Uh, I would I would arrange to meet a potential interviewee at a certain location, but then I would get a call or a text or, or something from Living Water Community saying, no, look, uh, we have this secured facility, let's do the interview here. So um, I think that, uh, you know, there are many factors that impact the kind of information that's revealed, including where interviews are taking place and also the 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 NGO or the organization that um, that the community engages with. Um, but Shiva, you want to share um, about having to sign the non-disclosure? Yeah, yes. yeah, I did. I did uh, mention it in the presentation. Um, so I was asked by Living Water Community to sign this this um, this agreement uh, to make sure that. You know, I don't ask. Um, I don't share the the specific information of these people and, and make them visible in my writing, etc. So, my writing and research, of course, were anonymized and um, uh, to protect the the interests of the the, mi the migrants. All right. Very interesting. Um... We have about five more minutes. Uh, there's one question here from, from Roy. Um, the Catholic Church in particular and a couple of NGOs have been in the 
the vanguard to get the Trinidad and Tobago government to regularize the status of Venezuelan, Venezuelan migrants and help deal with their various education and employment needs. Did you interview any of the NGOs involved in this? Um, I Well, like I said, I worked with uh, Living Water Community uh, specifically because they, like you said, are the vanguard, the sort of um, face of the, the Venezuelan migrant advocacy in Trinidad at, at the point I was doing uh, the research. Um, but I was not able to to speak specifically with uh, other NGOs, Natalie. I don't know if you had any engagement outside of Living Water. Um, well, I'm, I'm trying to remember if I have permission to share the name of the NGO, but I did work with one in Curacao. Um, in another project, um, the OAS has done some research on reception in the Americas. And so in that project, I did interview um, a lot of church, well, faith-based organization, primarily the, the Catholic church, providing support to the migrant community. And to be honest, if it wasn't for that, it, those interactions, it would have been difficult to get access to the data. They're providing critical services to the migrant community, um, sometimes <clears throat> services that the government doesn't want to provide. So like in Aruba and Curacao, the organizations are providing medical care because generally speaking, migrants don't have access to the public, the, not well, the health system. So yes, um, very important to involve these stakeholders and, and Shiva and I have been talking about how we might do further research on this specific. Okay, all right. I, I hope everyone enjoyed hearing from um, Natalie and, and Shiva. Um, it, you know, it's always interesting from my own perspective with, with qualitative research, hearing about how it is, um, you know, we, we often, we're overcoming the same challenges um, as as it relates to um, our research because that because there are, are, are a lot of um, similarities in terms of what you are grappling with with what I grapple with um, with my own research. Okay, so so um, thank you very much, Natalie and and, and Shiva. Um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed. Thanks also to the um, audience for listening and and for your engagement. And then um, last but not least to the. Uh, my food um, network for um, providing an, an opportunity for Natalie and, and Shiva to uh, disseminate their um, interesting work. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm Karin Bailey, a um, colleague of, of, of Natalie. Um, so um, thank you very much for having me um, as well and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>